In this video, I'll be presenting a derivation of the Beltrami identity, which is a formula used in classical mechanics to find the equations of motion for a particle whose Lagrangian doesn't have a, an explicit dependence upon time. Now, I'm guessing those listening to this video already have an idea of the Euler-Lagrange equation, but just to go through it. So in classical mechanics, you're often interested in integrating a Lagrangian over time to find something called the action. And you're, especially, you're looking for the, the function, let's call it x of t, which minimizes the action. So this is that function that when you integrate the Lagrangian, which itself depends upon some particle's position, velocity, and time, when you integrate that over time, then this is going to minimize the action. And the, the way to find that uh, equation x of t is by using the uh, Euler-Lagrange differential equation. So what this says is that you're going to take that Lagrangian L, which depends upon position, velocity, and time, take the x derivative, and then set that equal to the time derivative of the Lagrangian's uh, velocity derivative. So by plugging your Lagrangian into the Euler-Lagrange differential equation, what you'll end up getting is, well, of course, a differential equation, so you'd eventually solve that, and that's going to give you your function x of t, which is going to be your equation of motion corresponding to your Lagrangian. So the claim is in this video is that if you have one of these uh, simplified Lagrangians, which is to say that if L doesn't explicitly depend upon t, which is to say that if you write down your L and there's all t's in it, then this whole Euler-Lagrange equation can be simplified to this pretty simple formula, which is just Lagrangian itself minus x dot times the x dot partial in L is just equal to a constant, c. So that statement right there is the Beltrami identity. So let's go about deriving it. So the first thing I'm going to do is go back to the Lagrangian, and I'm going to know that it has uh, implicit dependence upon t. That is, if I change the value of t, then I do affect the value of x and x dot, which will then affect the value of the Lagrangian. So what I'm going to do first is take the total derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to time. So it's important to know here that I have to do the chain rule. So I have the explicit dependence upon t right here, this partial L over partial t. But then these two next terms, these are due to an implicit relation uh, upon t. So this is just basic chain rule right here. So you go through each one of the, the variables and just calculate the chain rule. But, so by assumption in this, in this problem, the Lagrangian is not going to have a, an explicit dependence upon t. So what that means is that the partial derivative of L with respect to t is going to be 0. So that means this first term right here is going to vanish in this derivation. Now, of course, it's important to distinguish this first term from the total derivative. So this first term is representing a, an explicit dependence upon t. So there's no t's, uh, no t's are going to appear in the Lagrangian. So we're going to set that equal to 0. And we're also going to recognize that dx dt is equal to x dot. And dx dot dt is equal to x double dot. Just in case the formatting wasn't clear, um, that should be an x double dot there. So one other thing to note here is that in this first term, this partial L, partial x, that's pretty similar to what I started with in the Euler Lagrange equation, except that it's being multiplied by this x dot here. So what I'm going to do is go back to the Euler Lagrange equation, which was uh, partial L, uh, partial x equals ddt of partial L, partial x dot. So to get to that first term, all I need to do is multiply both sides by x dot. Now what I'm going to do is just plop that entire right hand side into that first term right there. So what I then get is this equation that I had here with that, that new first term there, which came from the Euler-Lagrange equation. So this is what I have so far. And so far what we've done is just combine the, the equation for the total derivative of the Lagrangian with the Euler-Lagrange equation. So we're constraining that total derivative to fit the Euler-Lagrange equation by combining the two. So, so again, this is what I have so far. And really the, the last step of this derivation is just to, to make an observation about this right-hand side. Uh, so what you have to observe here is that this is similar to a product rule. In other words, um, this is something that could have come from a product rule. And the only question is to figure out what it came from, which product it came from. So it turns out that if you take the time derivative of x dot with partial L, partial x dot, then you can recover precisely this right-hand side. And just by going in reverse here, just taking the derivative of here using the product rule, you can see that the this is indeed equal to the right-hand side. So at this point, the derivation is almost complete. So what I'm going to do to wrap it up is 
take this entire right hand side and move it to the left. And then what I'm going to do is factor out this uh, differentiation operator DDT. So what I have is that L, which was left over from the left hand side, minus all the stuff I brought over from the right hand side. And that's all going to be set equal to zero. So I can see that all this stuff in parentheses, this L minus X dot times partial L partial X dot, this is unchanging with respect to T. So what does that mean? That means all the stuff in parentheses is equal to a constant, which I'll call C.